Hello, everyone. How are you? It's another time for Monday School. I hope you're excited. I'm excited. Lots to think about tonight as we finish up this unit in Second Chronicles. Tonight, we are looking at the Smith & Hellas Formation Series Lesson Outline for November the 26th. The Glory of the Lord, Second Chronicles 7, 1 through 10. So I'm excited to share this with you and hope you are excited to walk with me in this journey. This is a dramatic and inspirational passage. God sends fire to consume the sacrifices, giving visible approval to the temple that Solomon is dedicating. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. God is everywhere. We know that many of us have trouble accepting this to be true, yet God continues to show God's presence among us. If only we will pay attention. Israel had come to celebrate the completion of the temple. Solomon issues a call to worship, and God sends fire to consume what is on the altar. When have you seen God's presence in your worship? When have you seen God in your life? We're going to talk about some of those this morning. It, it may or may not be as dramatic as fire coming down to the altar of the temple, but I know that it's just as meaningful. Many adults today are skeptical about God's revelation of God's presence among us. Many adults today are not prepared spiritually to receive God's revelation of divine work. Many adults today are forsaking the gathering of spiritual community and worship. God works in mysterious ways. God desires fellowship with each of us. God is active in our world today. I see God's presence almost every day in my world. When I shared this at a conference last week, one person quickly responded, how do you see God's presence? Where do you see God's presence? God seems to be elusive in these days for many. With the economy breaking down, with wars raging, with personal satisfaction at record low numbers, many adults just have trouble believing that God is at work. Many adults today want tangible proof that God is present, that God cares about us, that God is guiding and many adults are just too busy to be more spiritually prepared. Many are not participating in ongoing Bible studies or weekly worship experiences. Many are so overburdened with family and work commitments that church gets the leftovers, so much so that one researcher has said the family prayer altar is now the back seat of the minivan and family prayer time is praying for a parking place closer to the event, not farther away. I wish the news were better. This was not the case for Solomon and Israel in today's passage. When the glorious temple was finished, Solomon dedicated this building to the glory of the Lord. And at the dedication worship, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Fire came down from heaven. Smoke was everywhere. Sacrificial offerings, too many to count. And the revival lasted for a week. And the people sang praises. For God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Singing, praising, praying, sacrificial giving. Sounds like church worship to me. 
the glory of God is a mysterious and wonderful experience. It may be as simple as seeing a baby smile or seeing a rainbow across the sky. It may be as complex as wondering how a child commits to Christ. However you encounter God, you for sure will not have an encounter unless you are looking for one, unless you are spiritually prepared for one. You may not have the experience Solomon had. Very few of us have had such an experience, but you will surely have a mysterious and awe-inspiring moment if you look, if you are spiritually prepared, if you are ready to receive the blessings of God. And so I start off this week as I've started off uh, the lessons for each of these weeks. Where have you seen God this week? What blessings are you celebrating and what is God doing in your life? I had an email this week from a friend who uh, I knew was a friend, but I wasn't sure I had added much to his life. And he writes to me to tell me two or three things that have happened in the last few weeks in his life, all because he had become friends with me, all because he had been a coaching client with me. I I stopped and wept and thanked God for such a blessing. We we think we contribute to people's lives. We hope we make a difference in people's lives. But I had a tangible response from someone saying thank you. That was the blessing of God. That was the presence of God in my life. And I, I've had four or five of those kinds of experiences this past week. And so I'm celebrating today those blessings that a couple of people took time enough to write me a thank you note just to say, appreciate you. Those mean so much to us so much to us. Even this week as I reached out to a friend whose mother had passed and said to him, I love you and I'm thinking of you and you are considered family at our house. And he responded, God must have known I needed to hear from you today. You'll never know what this phone call means. And so we bask in the presence of God's glory, the mysterious and awesome glory of God. What about you? When is a time in your life, even in maybe this past week, but in recent days, when have you known without a doubt you were in the presence of God? And then we come into examining this lesson as the chapter opens. Solomon ended his prayer and fire came down from heaven and consumed the offerings on the altar. Solomon is standing, praying a prayer of dedication. And as he says the amen, fire comes down to the altar. God's tangible approval. Where did this fire come from? How did this happen? We don't know. We can never explain God. Even though our class members keep asking us for tangible proof, if there were tangible proof, we wouldn't need faith. And Lamont, says that the opposite of faith is not unbelief. The opposite of faith is certainty. 
if we could be certain how this happened, if we could be certain where this came from, if we could be certain what this meant, we wouldn't need faith. But we know in other instances, fire didn't come down from heaven. We know at other points in worship, the glory of God didn't rain down upon them. But in this moment, as the building is dedicated, as Solomon prays his prayer of dedication and then says the amen, fire. And we know that fire was considered the sign of the presence of God in these early peoples. And the glory of God fills the temple. What does that mean? Well, I don't know for sure. What I think it means is that there was holy smoke, that the smoke from that fire filled the temple, not in a choking way, not in a way that got uh, ashes and soot all over everything, but that that smoke permeated through the building so that all could see the presence of God the glory of God. When have you witnessed the glory of God? What did that glory look like to you? What did that glory feel like to you? Have some time talking about this great prayer of invocation, if you will, from Solomon. And then what follows in verses four through six, the praise and prayers of the people. This is this is really and truly an order of worship. Solomon prays a prayer, and God responds. The people sing praises and have prayers, and God responds. And then there is the benediction, and the people go home. Sounds like worship to me. So in the mid part of worship, there are prayers and praise. Almost 150 animals, uh, 150,000 animals were sacrificed across the land. You, now, this was not just 150,000 people in the temple or 150,000 people even in Jerusalem. Scripture tells us from one side of Israel to the other side of Israel, the people were celebrating. How did they know when to stand up? When did they sit down? How did they know when to sing? This was not a simultaneous worship being satellite broadcast across Israel. This was local regional gatherings of the people and then a bulk of them being in Jerusalem. This was not a hundred thousand people in Athens, Georgia, getting ready to watch my Georgia Bulldogs play. Israel, from one side of Israel to the other, from the top of Israel to the bottom, they were gathered in small groups having worship. And in that process, over 150,000 animals were sacrificed. A portion of each animal is placed on the altar. The rest is given to the priests and then to the people. 150,000 animals sacrificed would be enough food to feed this, 150, uh, this multitude of people for two weeks or more. And, and then we say 150,000 animals being sacrificed. That's, that's way beyond sacrifice. That's slaughter. But remember, it was not all in the altar in, Israel, in Jerusalem. It was spread out. And remember also, Solomon is giving witness to those around him. The greatest building for the greatest God the greatest worship service for the greatest God, the greatest sacrifice for the greatest God. 
Solomon is trying to make a point. The greatest God deserves the greatest worship. And so Solomon is on the altar in all of his grandeur, leading the worship event. The priests and the Levites are stationed throughout the temple and throughout the land. And the priests are leading in prayers. The Levites are leading in song. And they are singing continually, God's steadfast love endures forever. God's steadfast love endures forever. And it is a refrain that is being woven throughout the land, sung throughout the land, spoken throughout the land. Remember, not everyone got to go into the temple proper. There were places, stages, if you will, where you were allowed. The women were in the back. And they would have been humming this refrain over and over. God's steadfast love endures forever. And the choir of women would have been singing. And then the men in the next level and then priests and Levites in the third level, and on and on the chorus would continue to be echoed. God's steadfast love remains, endures forever. It would have been an over-the-top worship event, regardless of how many people were gathered in Jerusalem. It would have been a gathering that would be talked about for ages, a gathering we're still talking about centuries, generations later. God's steadfast love endures forever. What does that mean? What does that mean to you? Has there ever been a time in your life when God has let you down? My hunch is, if you're being honest, the answer is no. Has there ever been a time when you have let God down? My hunch is we would all answer yes to that. God loves us with a rich and abiding, with a mysterious and inspiring kind of love. And for those of us who come to Jesus, we are sons and daughters of the heavenly creator, father, God. And just as we earthly parents love our earthly children, God loves us even more. God's steadfast, solid, trustworthy love endures forever. And, and we are the recipients of that love. And then it all comes to an end, as all good things must. But for a week, or maybe even two weeks, depending on how you count time, they'd had revival. They had had a high Jewish holiday. And on that high Jewish holiday, the temple was dedicated, and then through the time, for eight days, they'd had worship, and they'd had prayer, and they'd had praise. And every time they came together, they sung the refrain, God's steadfast love endures forever. And then the people leave filled with joy. When you leave your worship each week, how do you feel? When you leave your worship each week, have you been filled with the glory of God? Well, if not, why not? Who is responsible for the positive outcome of your worship? Well, actually, you are. 
your pastoral leaders structure the worship each week in hopes that their worship is pleasing to God and meaningful to you, but you ultimately are responsible for your own worship. I'm reminded of the story of the pastor who stood before his people on a Sunday and preached a, an awe-inspiring sermon, and at the end of worship was a glorious outpouring of response. And it was an amazing day of worship, and everyone left their church that day knowing that they had been in the presence of God. That evening, the pastor and one of his deacons went across town where the pastor preached the same sermon with the same fervor to a different group meeting in a revival service. And it fell flat. Nothing happened. No one responded at the altar call. As the pastor and the deacon were evaluating the service in a McDonald's down the street, the deacon asked with some confusion, Pastor, this morning you preached that sermon and there was such an outpouring of God's presence. There was such an outpouring of people's response. And tonight, nothing. How do you explain that, Pastor? And the pastor wisely said, the key to effective worship is preparation. I have to prepare, but the people also have to prepare. If you had been involved in the building of Solomon's temple, you would have been so excited to see the completion, not because it was over, but because you made a contribution And all of Israel, in some way or another, had contributed to the building of this temple. And it was a great time of celebration. And it was a great time of seeing the presence of God in place. And here's how the story ends. On the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people away away to their homes, joyful and glad of heart for the goodness that the Lord had shown to David and to Solomon and to Israel, God's people. Do you notice that benediction? The praise does not fall on Solomon alone. The story ends as the story began. David did the planning. Solomon did the implementation, and Israel benefited and celebrated. The story ends with God and David and Solomon and Israel reminding people that God was the author and finisher of this work. Never forget Israel, never forget Israel, what God has done for David. David had the plans. David had the vision. David made preparation. David built the partnerships. David did all the work on the front end. Never forget that David is a part of this temple. Never forget Israel, never forget Israel, what God has done for David and for Solomon. Solomon had to build the thing. It took him seven years or 10 years, depending on how you count time and depending on who you listen to. And never forget Israel that has given you this blessing as well and this celebration as well. And God has filled you with this joy. I'm reminded of another scripture similar. 
as Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he says, I have planted, Apollos has watered, but God gave the growth. Paul knew his work in Corinth was a good work, but it was not his alone. Apollos knew that God had done a good work, but it was not his alone. God gave the growth. And, and so it is for us. In your church, someone early on had a vision. And someone else took up that vision and implemented. And now you are benefiting from those generations before you. And you are building a legacy for the next generation. But never forget, Israel, Never forget, church, that it is God who gives us the growth. It is God that gives us the celebrations. It is God that gives us the blessings. It is God that gives us the joy. And next week, we begin a journey of joy as Advent begins. And we revisit the story afresh and anew of the birth of Jesus. So let us depart for our homes filled with that refrain, the steadfast love of God endures forever. Amen and amen. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for the glory that you bestow upon us, for the presence that you bring to us. Thank you for that. And thank you for this reminder that you are always active in our lives, even as you were in the lives of David and Solomon to the building of this great temple, even as you were in the lives of Paul and Apollos and the spreading of your word, even as you have been in the generations in our church before us. Help us now, O oh God, to rededicate ourselves to the legacy that we are building as we pass it on to the generations to come so that all of us might join in the great refrain, the steadfast love of God endures forever. We give you thanks through Jesus the Christ. Amen. Hey, everybody. Bo in the beard saying thanks for joining me. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode of Monday School, and we start Advent, my favorite time of the year. I can't wait to uh, enjoy this journey of Advent with you as we prepare for the Christmas season. Have a great week of Thanksgiving, everyone. I can't wait to uh, share with my family in these coming days and um, celebrate with you as well along the way. Bow in the beard. Happy Thanksgiving. See you next week.